Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today, we're very lucky to be joined by Cynthia Phillips, who's uh, a PI here at the SETI Institute, principal investigator and uh, planetary scientist. She did her uh, BA at Harvard in astronomy and astrophysics, uh, and then uh, moved to the University of Arizona to do her PhD uh, where in planetary sciences, uh, where she looked at uh, Voyager and Galileo images uh, detecting geological activity on Io and Europa. Uh, she uh, joined the SETI Institute uh, uh, as uh, part of a uh, postdoc program with NASA Ames uh, and uh, worked with Chris Chiber on looking for geological activity uh, and the means to detect it on Europa. Uh, she also has uh, looked at small comet abundances uh, in the solar system and uh, impact gardening processes on icy satellites. And she's also uh, very interested in uh, things such as dark slope streaks on Mars. Uh, and uh, she wrote, she was a lead author of uh, a white paper uh, to the Decadal Survey on the exploration of Europa. Uh, and of course, uh, you will all know her uh, as the coordinator of our REU, a very successful REU program, um, which just concluded. Um, in which she's uh, still in the recovery phase of. So please join me in welcoming Cynthia. Thanks, Adrian. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. So as Adrian said, my name is Cynthia Phillips, and I'm a senior research scientist here at the SETI Institute. So today I'll be giving you an update on the search for active geologic processes on Mars, Europa, and beyond with a bonus update on this little rover that's been driving around on Mars. So solar system geology is what I study. And if you look at the solar system, if you look at the, the, the whole suite of bodies that we have, most planetary surfaces are ancient. And in fact, the first mission to go and um, take a look at Mars was very disappointing because we had this, this flyby. It was the, the, one of the Mariner missions. We had this flyby. We were going to be very excited to finally see the surface up close of a planet, another planet, for the first time. We'd, of course, been able to see the Earth's moon, our own moon, from telescopic observations just from here on the Earth. And we knew that the moon was old and covered with craters and really pretty boring from a geological point of view. Not to disparage the moon. It's a great place. But there isn't that much geology going on. It's an old cratered surface. All the processes there are exogenic. Exogenic is a term that'll come up in this talk. It means that everything that's happened from the surface came from outside. It was created from beyond the planet or satellite. And so on the moon, most of what we see is exogenic. It's old, it's cratered, it's been pounded for four and a half billion years by impactors. And there's a few endogenic features. So endogenic means created from within. So there's a few features on the moon that are signs of volcanic activity very early in lunar history, but there's really, there hasn't been much going on there except for a few footprints about, you know, 30, 40 years ago. There hasn't been much going on on the surface except for these craters for billions of years. So there's no current geological activity on the moon. So when we first took our first steps beyond our own little Earth-Moon system out into the, the vast realms of the rest of our solar system, we looked at Mars and we were so excited. There were these stories about canals on Mars. Potentially, there is a Martian civilization. People were really excited. And our first images of Mars looked like the moon. We happened to go past part of Mars that's old, you know, the old crater highlands. There was nothing going on there except craters. And it was really disappointing. It wasn't until later missions that we finally got a view of Mars that saw that, yes, there's something that's not just craters. So, I'll go through some of my favorite places in the solar system with a focus on active geologic processes. So I'm going to focus on worlds where there's something going on aside from cratering. And I like cratering, and so the part of my research that I'm not going to discuss today focuses on impact cratering, what we can learn about the subsurface thermal profile, all sorts of great stuff, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Today I'm going to talk about active processes. So Mercury, Venus, potentially, and most of the moons of the outer solar system all have very old surfaces. But some planetary surfaces do show evidence of current geologic processes. Mars, for example. We have sand dunes, we have dust devils, we have slope streaks, we have 
interesting ongoing geologic activity that we can see today on the surface. I'll also go through some great pictures of Io. This is a volcanic moon of Jupiter where we see volcanoes that are actively erupting. We have lava flows on the surface. We have new plumes of material being vented off into space. Enceladus is a tiny moon of Saturn that nobody really thought was all that interesting. We just thought it was this little tiny kind of icy world. And then we flew by with the Cassini spacecraft and found these geysers of material venting from the South Pole. It was crazy. Um, Titan is a big moon of Saturn. And again, on Titan, we think we've seen some subtle changes in lakes at the poles. Yes, Titan has lakes on it. They're not lakes of water, though. And then even out in the Neptune system, uh, Triton has plumes of what we think are nitrogen venting off the surface. And I'll also mention my favorite place in the solar system, Europa. I couldn't give a talk without focusing on Europa. Europa is another moon of, of Jupiter, and Europa could have interesting things going on in it. So this talk will be an overview of active geological processes in the solar system. And I'll focus it based on target, but I'll look at what kinds of processes could currently take place there. Where can we observe them and how can we observe them? Much of my research focuses on image processing, which is pretty pictures, but pretty pictures that you can do science with. So what I've, what I've found is that pictures are really what grabs the audience. And so if I'm sitting in one of these, up in a public talk at a conference or one of these colloquia, and the speaker is up there putting up word after word and wiggly line after wiggly line, it loses my attention. Pictures are what captures you. It captures the imagination. And so my scientific career has really focused on pictures, but scientific pictures. What can we use? Pretty pictures, images, color images, mosaics of images, big maps, changes, 3D images. What kind of science can we do with those? What do these images tell us about the solar system? So before I go into all of that, I had to give you guys an update on the Mars Curiosity rover, because this is just one of the most amazing missions that's ever been launched. So the, the artist's conception here at the top is what we thought the Mars Curiosity rover would look like on, on the surface of Mars. And down here is a self-portrait. This is what it actually looks like. This is a portrait of, you know, it looks kind of like a face. It's very anthropo anthropomorphized. And so, you know, you kind of have two eyes, and it's looking back at us, and this is actually taken, you know, it's kind of like you're, you're, if you want to prove you've been somewhere, you hold up your camera or your cell phone, and you take a, you know, kind of strange perspective shot of yourself standing in front of, you know, the Eiffel Tower in the background, right? So this is Curiosity's self-portrait on Mars. And it's very hazy looking, not because there's a huge sandstorm, but because this was taken with another instrument that still had the dust cover on. So that's why it's a little bit funny looking. But it's proof, it's proof this thing is really there on the surface of Mars. Don't read the, the comments online and discussion boards where it's all a conspiracy. No, it's real. It's really there. So this mission launched November 26, 2011. This is what it looks like during its cruise phase. So the rover, it's big. It's this big nuclear-powered car. It's about the size of a Mini Cooper. So it's a, it's a big rover. We're not talking a little shoebox on wheels. We're not talking kind of like a you know, person-sized one, like Spirit and Opportunity. We're talking car size. And it took about eight, nine months to get to Mars. And for anyone who was at NASA Ames this summer on August 6th to watch the landing, that was just a phenomenal evening. It was amazing to watch this and to be together with a whole group of people who thought NASA was cool. It was really exciting. So, so here's what happened. And so we had this, this um, period that the um, entry and descent and landing engineers, these are these geniuses at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory down in Southern California, they devised this insane sounding system of landing because this rover is big, okay? We've had previous rovers that have landed using just retro rockets, but the problem with that is that you totally destroy the surface around you. So if you're trying to measure Care, make careful measurements of the chemical composition of the surface, if you've blasted it with rocket fuel during your descent, your chemistry is going to be totally off. So we didn't want to use retro rockets. We've used airbags in the past, and we've kind of gotten used to the, the, first, the first airbag landing, the Mars, um, with uh, the Mars Pathfinder mission, we thought it was crazy to have a rover basically land, inflate airbags, and bounce around on the surface until it came to a stop. It sounded totally crazy, but it worked. And we used it three times. It worked three times beautifully. So we kind of got used to it. Unfortunately, the airbags that you would need for a mission as big as the Curiosity lander would just be gigantic. 
they'd be, you know, multiple stories tall. So it's just, it's not feasible to land a mission this big and this precisely using airbags. The problem with airbags is you can't do a precisely targeted landing because you can't control for how much this thing's going to bounce and roll around on the surface before it finally comes to a stop. So the engineers went back to the drawing board and they came up with this even crazier sounding landing technique called the sky crane. When I first heard about this, I thought someone was joking. I thought this was some, you know, some like crazy, either like a, like a sixth grade science project someone had come up with, or like a crazy science fiction story. Um, but it was real. And I can say this now, it worked. I would, you know, I, I know that the engineers at JPL are brilliant. I trusted in the science, but I think all of us were biting our nails on August 6th because, man, they pulled it off, but it just, it's just it's crazy. And so what happens is you come in and you start looking like that, that interplanetary spacecraft, right? So in that, that other image I showed you, and then there's this seven-minute period, basically, between when it enters the atmosphere, it goes through peak heating, you once you've slowed down enough, and Mars is this really thin atmosphere, so it's actually really hard to land on Mars. People don't realize this because NASA's been so successful, but a lot of countries don't have that success record. The Soviet Union, for example, tried and tried and tried and tried and tried, and they still have never landed anything successfully on Mars. We're, in fact, the only country that's managed to do this. So Mars has this really thin atmosphere. It's just thick enough that you have to pay attention to it, but it's really too thin to give you much help in slowing you down. So uh, they came in with a parachute. That's this, um, it's the largest uh, hypersonic parachute ever built. Again, remember this, this capsule is really big. So you come in on a parachute, you slow down as much as you can. Then once you're slowed down enough, you eject your heat shield. That's this, this back shell right here and begin detecting the ground. And this is really important because this is what you're landing on. It's the sky crane. So you have this robotic, it's basically, it's like a flying saucer. It's like this, this, this jet-powered backpack that's coming in. It has the lander underneath it. Once you get closer to the surface, you start descending, the, the lander starts descending on this tether. It gets closer and closer. Finally, it touches the ground. And then you don't want this jet-powered backpack to crash into your lander. What, you, you've gone to all this trouble to land on the surface. So then it takes off and, and really fast in another direction until it crash lands somewhere else. So, so here's just, again, some artist's conceptions. This is what the rover would look, the, the spacecraft would look like after it jettisoned this, this uh, heat shield. So here's the rover all folded up. Here's the parachute. And then this is what it looks like. Here's the sky crane. Again, this is artist's conception. So we didn't have, an, we didn't have a, a news team on the ground on Mars taking pictures of this. But if we had, you know, if there was actually someone watching this land, what a day that would have been. I mean, it would have just, you know, imagine one of these shows up in your backyard. It's just crazy, right? So you have this giant, you know, jet-powered backpack here. You have this rover, this car-sized rover descending on a 25-foot-long tether. And then it touches down on the surface, right? So here it is. It's touched down. It waited for two seconds to make sure it wasn't moving anymore because you wouldn't want to touch down and then not actually be touched down. So once they've actually determined they were on the surface, then this thing cuts the tether and goes off and crashes in another direction. So it sounds crazy, but it worked. And even better, this thing had a video camera on it as it was going down called Marty. It's this Mars Descent Imager. So this is the first time that we've had decent high-definition images that were taken during a landing. Uh, we have similar images that were taken during the Huygens landing on Titan, on Saturn's moon Titan. Um, but we had some problems that the, the, um, bandwidth, the band rate was very limited with those, and we had some problems with only getting back about half the images we planned. So there have been videos made from that, but they're a little bit unsatisfying. This one, so the MARTI instrument took images at a frame rate of about four frames per second, which is pretty jerky and slow. And so some of you may have seen the preliminary videos that were done with that, and they're cool. They're really cool. But what's even better is what just members of the general public have done with that data. So what I'm going to show you was interpolated by a guy named Bard Canning to 30 frames per second. So what this is, is it takes that kind of jerky stop motion feel and it makes it into a smooth, it looks like you're in a movie. So let me just show you guys this video. And you can get this. It's on, a, it's on YouTube and it's just amazing. So this video is going to start. Here's the back shield. So this is it actually falling. So remember, this is real data. It's been interpolated so that it, it's smoothed out in between the frames. 
but it's real. So you're watching this, this heat shield fall down to the surface. Here, you're seeing Mars, right? So here's kind of some, some more general terrain. This is the kind of material that Curiosity landed in. And we're on a parachute here, so that's why it's swinging back and forth. You're swinging, you're on this, this long tether from the parachute going up. These are some dark dunes right here. So that's what this dark material is. And you'll see some variation in the brightness. That was just unavoidable um, due to the interpolation process that was used. But Again, this is it's real data, and if you go on if you go online, you can see. Um, I think they posted the link to this on the Google Hangout, so you guys can go and watch this on you know the biggest screen TV that you have. It's it just looks amazing. Um, so we're going down more, and this is speeded up a bit, but it's it's fairly close to real time. So this is about three minutes, kind of the final stages of descent um, from that heat shell that that back shell separation. So what you're seeing as we get closer and closer to the ground, you're seeing some small craters. Um, you're seeing a lot of these dark sand dunes. And they're dark probably because they're made up of a different kind of material from this more background terrain. So now as we get closer, we're going to reach the point where we actually, here we go. So now we've started powered flight. So we've cut the parachute. We've turned on the, the jet-powered backpack. The sky crane is starting to descend on the tether. And once it, you'll, you'll see in just a minute, you'll see this big plume of dust go up from the surface. You'll see the wheel of the rover pop into view. And that tells you that, that, that it's fully descended on the tether. So here we go, we're closer. There's the dust. Here's the wheel. We're going down. We landed. That's in real time. That's how fast this thing was. And here's what it looks like on the surface. OK, so see right there, there's these kind of disrupted areas. Those are the scars made from the, the, the jet pack as it got close to the surface. And here's what it looks like. So this is just a zoom. Again, this is real data. This is what it really looks like on the surface of Mars, where Curiosity landed. Remember that kind of dark region of sand dunes? It's right there. So this is where we landed. Here's that self-portrait. So we're just zooming out. This is the proof, you know, hi, Mom. Look, I'm here. Hey, I'm on Mars. So here we are. Um, and again, this is taken through a, a, a slight camera cover, so that's why it's, it's so red looking. But this video is amazing. You can find it on YouTube, and thanks to, to uh, the person who made this. It's pretty amazing. So here's what the rover looks like. Um, and this is point, there's a, a ton of instruments on this thing. I like this image because it points out all the cameras because I'm a camera person, so I'm showing my bias here. But so what you're seeing is there's a lot of cameras. There's these front and rear hazard cameras. Marty, the descent imager, was mounted on the bottom of the spacecraft. Um, and then you see up here we have some more navigation cameras. We have the mast cams. Those are the ones that can actually zoom in and take decent um, telephoto images of far off parts of the surface. Um, and then chem cam right here. That's the laser. If you've heard that this is a nuclear-powered rover with a laser that can vaporize rocks, that's true. It has a laser. It can vaporize rocks. The reason you'd want to do that is not so you can zap the aliens or try to break out of jail or anything, but if you actually vaporize rocks, you can then study the, the spectrum of material that comes off of them, and you can determine what chemical elements they're made out of. So this is going to be one of the first times that we'll be able to take real measurements of the compositions of some of these rocks on the surface. Here's, again, so here's, this is an actual image now. So here is Curiosity on the surface. This is kind of the wheels on the ground picture. OK, yes, my wheels are really on the surface of Mars. Um, and a, an interesting tidbit is that if you look at the treads on the wheels, um, the pattern in them actually spells that JPL in Morse code. So uh, all of the, all the wheel marks it leaves on the surface. And this mission hopefully will go on for at least a year, maybe as many as four years, maybe even more. There's going to be a whole line of tra a trail of uh, <laughs> wheel marks that all say JPL on the surface. So one of the coolest aspects of this mission is this robotic arm. Now, this isn't just a little kind of you know, scoop on an, on an arm like previous missions have had. This thing's seven feet long. So this is a huge robotic arm. And on the tip of it, it has this, this instrument head that's just amazing. It has a camera, and it's this microscopic camera. So it can, you can put this thing really close to a rock, and it can zoom in, and it can image the, the mineral grains. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be amazing for the mineralogist. Um, it has a drill, so it can actually, it's this amazing um, percussive drill that can actually beat up on material, so it's not just drilling. And the technology that was used in a lot of this um, robotic arm has a lot of applications to other fields. 
So the, the scientists and engineers who helped develop this are thinking about things like robotic medicine. You could maybe have tele, ro robotically or teleoperated uh, medical suites where if you had a, a battlefield situation, imagine that you, you bring your wounded, your wounded person into this robotic operating suite. You have a doctor or a surgeon who's far off in a safer zone that can actually operate remotely. Some of that same technology development that goes into that is the same sort of is the same sort of thing that's gone into development of this arm. Uh, another application is these um, these factories in a can that would basically be deployed to say a nuclear meltdown site where you can have either completely autonomous robots that could go about certain tasks or you could have them remotely operated. So the development of a robotic arm like this is really helping the development of robotics in general um, here on Earth with all sorts of applications, not just for planetary exploration. But of course, planetary exploration is the coolest thing you can do with this technology. So, so in addition to this, it has a spectrometer, it has a scoop, and it has this, this amazing system for sieving and portioning samples of powdered rock and soil that'll then go into little ovens on the spacecraft where they can be cooked and studied and analyzed and tested. So this is by far the most sophisticated mission we've ever landed on Mars. So here's just one of these instruments. This is the um, Alpha Particle X-Base Spectrometer. If you look at this, I mean, it looks like something, it looks like a Borg, right? I mean, it looks like something out of Star Trek. It's this crazy looking, you know, series of, of wires and cameras. And right here, this is actually the, the instrument. So the idea is that you take this robotic arm, you very gently move it around so that you find a rock that you like, and you put various instruments that are actually touching the rock. So when you're touching a rock with this APXS, you can, you can use this instrument, again, to determine the composition of the rock. So this is just one of the instruments that's on this robotic arm. So here is what we can see from orbit. So remember, this is not the only spacecraft at Mars. The high-rise camera is this basically a spy satellite in orbit. And it's on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft. This is the landing site. Pointer sign. This is the landing site right here. So see these kind of bluish blast zones? That's from the um, descent rockets on that on the descent stage. Here's the landing site, and here's tracks. There's Curiosity. We can see it from orbit. How cool is that? You can actually see the tracks so that as Curiosity drives on the surface, we can see it. We can track it. We can figure out exactly where it is and what it's seeing. And this is it's just it's just amazing to me that we can see rover tracks on the surface of Mars from orbit. Here's what it looks like, a comparison from the, the view from Curiosity. Here's its view on the surface. So again, you see this kind of close-up material. Here's these dunes. These dark dunes are a bit further away. This right here is Mount Sharp. So this is the mountain that it's heading towards. And this is why the landing site was chosen. It's this series of sedimentary layers. We think they're sedimentary. Just layer after layer after layer. And as any geologist knows, as you go deeper in layers, you go back in time. So by studying the various outcrops, the different layers of this, we'll be able to determine what was going on on Mars, not just now, not just in the recent past, but we'll be able to go back in time, down deeper and deeper through these layers. Um, and this is a, a great image that Lori Fenton, one of the scientists here at the SETI Institute made, where she took this, this image from the rover, and she compared it with an image taken from the, the CTX instrument, again, an orbital image. So here's Curiosity up at the top, right here in this little dot. So each of these points, so 230 meters is about here. So each of these dots, so here, this 3.7 kilometers from the landing site is where this dark dune field is. And then here we go, 16.2 kilometers, that's to the top of Mount Sharp. So this is kind of the traverse that it'll go on. And it'll take a while to get there, but the spacecraft has a long warranty. If spirit and opportunity are anything to go by, this thing is going to be driving well past its expiration date. And we have just so much ahead of us. So here's just what some of the layers look like. So this is an image taken, a really zoomed in image from one of those mass cams. And see this little tiny dot right there? Right there, it's zoomed in. That's the size of the rover. So this is deceptively close. This looks like you're out in the desert in Utah or Nevada somewhere. It's not, this is Mars. It's surprisingly Earth-like. It's surprisingly interpretable. But it's Mars, and we're there, and we are going to go see this. Here's some rover tracks. This is where we're going. So I'm going to leave you there with I'm going to leave you there with the Curiosity mission. I didn't mention much science yet because we're still in the checkout phase. 
This thing only landed August 6th. They're still basically making sure everything works right. They're heading toward their first target, but stay tuned. The Mars websites, the um, Curiosity Twitter feed has all sorts of amazing updates that you'll be able to see. So let me segue from there into some of my work on uh, active geologic processes on Mars. So the sort of things that I study, some of those features were visible in those images we just went through. Um, I, if we look at what kinds of things are going on on Mars today? Well, we know that there's a lot of aeolian processes, that means generated by the wind. One of the biggest are sand dunes. We saw that dark dune field on Mars. And so sand dunes are thought to form and change. They're the result of sand blowing around on the surface. So there's kind of a debate as to whether these are an exogenic or an endogenic process. And I would kind of say that they're on the exogenic side because you're looking at, you have an atmosphere on Mars, you have wind, you have sand, it's on the surface, it's just blowing around. It's not really interacting with the subsurface at all. It doesn't matter if Mars is warm and wet and active or if it's cold and dry and dead, that sand's still going to be blowing around. So it doesn't really tell us much about endogenic geologic activity. We have other interesting, um, interesting things going on on Mars, interesting changes, like uh, defrosting polar dunes. This is in the, this is a, a seasonal change where you see dunes that are icy and then they have get these dark spots as they defrost as spring comes. We see in this image here, these are new dune gullies. So see these new gullies that have formed from the peak of this dune. Um, so again, there are processes going on on these dunes um, and these could be more on the endogenic side of things. We also have dust devils. These have been observed from um, orbital images as well as rover images. This right here is an active dust devil. It was caught in the act of making this track. And you can see there's tracks all over the surface kind of going in just crazy directions. Um, they mostly tell us about atmospheric processes though. So again, they don't tell us much about, about what's going on in the subsurface. So slope streaks are one feature that I've been studying. This is an active process that's forming today that depending on which model you believe might tell us something about the subsurface. There's two formation models. So basically, these are, these are slope streaks. So this is a, this is a ridge or a, a higher altitude point, and you have these streaks that are coming down. And these features are relatively narrow, a couple hundred meters. They can be as long as a couple kilometers long. And the contrast difference between them and the background train is only about 10%. So all of the images of these that I'll be showing you have been really stretched so that you can see them. And there's two main formation models. There's a dry formation model, where these just form through dry dust avalanches on the surface. But there's also a wet model where these are the result of liquid, maybe liquid water, maybe brines, somewhere close to the surface. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of my work um, using change detection techniques to uh, come up with regional and global resurfacing rates from these features. So slope streaks were actually first seen at very low resolution by the Viking orbiters, and then they were observed later by subsequent spacecraft, such as the Mars Global Surveyor. Um, here's an image taken from Viking, and then here's an image 27 years later from orbit from uh, the Mars Orbiter camera on Mars Global Surveyor. And you can see here's some new streaks that have formed. So new streaks forming over a 27-year period, that's pretty interesting. Um, they come from a point, slope on, a point source on a slope. Um, we've seen new ones between Viking and Mars Global Surveyor, but we've actually seen new ones form during our active missions. Now we have so many missions in orbit around Mars that we're basically always observing the surface. And so we've seen these form where we'll go by, we'll take an image, there's nothing. We'll go around again, next time we get to that location on the surface, a couple months later, as short as 100 days, I think it's probably even shorter now, um, now that we have images with even higher resolution cameras, so 100 days later or less, new features will have formed. So these features are forming now, and they're forming often. They're actually one of the most common forms of mass movement that's currently taking place on Mars. So again, there's these two models. The dry dust avalanche model basically says that you have fine-grained dust that's coating the surface. And if you've ever seen an image of Mars during one of these global dust storms, you know that dust is everywhere on the surface of Mars. During a dust storm, you basically have the atmosphere completely filled with dust. You can't even see the surface. And actually, one of our, our spacecraft, one of the, again, one of the early orbiters, had the unfortunate circumstance of getting to Mars during a global dust storm. And you couldn't see anything, and it was completely disappointing. 
fortunately, it survived in orbit long enough for the dust to clear out, and then it could actually see the surface. Um, but these global dust storms transport dust all over the surface. So one possibility is that once you build up enough dust, underneath that dust, there could be a darker toned subsurface layer. And if you build up enough dust on a slope, some of the dust could just destabilize and kind of roll down the slope. Um, and the surface layer is disturbed and looks dark. So that's sort of the dry model. And that's, you know, that's interesting, but not so interesting from a subsurface point of view. The wet model is what's really interesting if you're interested in what's going on underneath the surface of Mars. One of the, when these features were first seen, it was suggested that maybe they're actually surface flows. And that's difficult because liquid water isn't currently stable at the surface of Mars. And so one of the problems with that is that how do you, how do you get this water to the surface and how do you stabilize it there long enough to flow down a hill and make this nice looking feature? The vapor pressure is way too low. The atmosphere of Mars is too thin. It's too cold. It's very difficult to stabilize liquid water at the surface. But if you have enough brines in this water, if you have enough other stuff, maybe you could stabilize it. Maybe you have groundwater that makes it almost to the surface, that saturates the surface and changes the color. Or maybe it's kind of a fluidized debris flow. So this is sort of a combination of the dust avalanche model with some liquidy, gooey sort of stuff, right? And stuff is a highly scientific technical term here. Um, but what's interesting is when we look at the shapes of these features, they really seem to have a fluid rheology. That means that they have a lot of the features that liquid would have flowing on a surface. And so if we just look at some more of these features, they seem to issue from a source point, so a single point up here. This is the top of the slope. And they go down, and they spread out a bit as they go downhill. Uh, they can continue for a kilometer or even more. And they, they're, they've been seen to veer around topographic obstacles. It was originally thought that they almost had no relief on them as well, um, although I'll show you some images later that show that, yes, there is topographic relief. It's just very subtle. So some of these have a very interesting looking shape, See this fan shape. If you saw one, something like this on the Earth, you think, well, of course, it's, it's a river. It's some kind of liquid that's flowing on the surface. It has very sharp boundaries. It has basically the same albedo throughout the surface. Sometimes you get these really complicated braided looking uh, features where you have channels that form, they reconnect, they spread out again. Um, is called anastomosing when it happens with, uh, with, with channels here on the Earth. And they're just weird. We just don't have a good explanation for how these could form. We do know that they form in particular temperate locations, so kind of in equatorial regions on Mars. And they're in regions of low thermal inertia. That means the surface is very dusty. So here's some, new, here's some more uh, new streaks that we've observed. So again, the, the circles show where there's, there's new streaks that have formed over a six-year period between these observations. Um, and so some of my work has involved quantifying the rate of change of these features. And so to do this, this is a method that I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail on. This is a method that I've used on multiple bodies in the solar system, where you choose regions of the surface imaged at different times by often different spacecraft, different cameras. You line them up as closely as possible. You reproject them to the same viewing geometry. So like in that previous image, you want to get the same view of the surface with two different timestamps. And then you co-register them. So I developed this um, iterative co-registration process that basically takes the first image and registers it to the second, and then takes the second and registers, it registers it to the first. You go back and forth until you get these images to often sub-pixel correlations between the two. You maximize a correlation coefficient. And then you take a ratio, and the ratio shows changes. So here's an example of, of when this procedure works well. Here's two mock images taken about half a year apart, half an Earth year apart. And you can see that there are some new features that formed. So in an ideal situation, if the images were perfectly matched in illumination, in sun angle, in viewing geometry, um, then when you took a ratio, if nothing changed, then your ratio image would just be a flat gray. So if new features form, the features that look dark in this ratio are here. These are the new streaks. And so if you go back and look at this, this second image, then sure enough, these are four new streaks that you can see down here. Things that look bright in the ratio image are actually where streaks have brightened. So what we're seeing is that not only are there new streaks that have formed, but this older streak has faded over this time period. 
And so the structure that we see in the background of this ratio image basically means that the images were not perfectly matched in illumination and viewing geometry. And you can see that if you look at this topographic feature up here, the shadows are slightly different. So I, of course, would like to tell the, the folks who do the observation planning for these spacecraft to keep taking the same images over and over again. Don't change them. And of course, that's not what they want to do at all. They want to take totally different pictures and see what it looks like. We've already seen there. Why do you want to keep taking pictures of the same place on the surface? So often, the pictures that I want and the pictures that the rest of the team want are, are inverse to each other. Um, so I'm sort of left digging up whatever scraps of images I can find that happen to overlap that weren't planned that way. You know, that's how it is. So this is what the, the correlation program that I use looks like. This is kind of an old version of it, but basically it's, it's pretty tedious. So this is why we have students, right? So you, know, you give a student a whole bunch of images, and you say, hey, go, go line up all these, all these features for me. And so they go and click, OK, this feature is this feature, and this one is this one, and this one is this one. And they put all the Xs on to show which features correspond. And you need a lot of these, at least a dozen, maybe more um, po match points between images to get a good cor correlation. And in some cases, you need a lot more, and it's pretty tricky to get them lined up. So fortunately, I've had, I've, I've had the pleasure of having many students that I've worked with that I've, I've trained to do this, and they've come up with some great results for me. So this is another, uh, another kind of thing that you can do with uh, slope streaks. Here's a particularly large streak that we found. And this one is really interesting because it's big, and it separates into these two branches down here at the bottom. And it's one of the first ones that we saw where there's actually some topography there. So we separated this up into an erosional zone at the top and then a depositional zone down at the bottom. We measured uh, topographic po profiles across it, and we estimated the total sediment that was transported in the formation of this feature. And then we were fortunate enough to get some super high resolution data of the ends of this slope streak. And you can see there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on. So again, we're seeing there's these craters that have actually been filled in by the streak. But there's a little bit of kind of downslope remnants of these craters. So it's as if something flowed, and it filled in the crater and kept going. But you see a little bit of the, the edges of the crater as you go down. We see these strange mounds. And again, here's a crater that's close enough to the end of the flow that you actually have some gaps in the streak material. So it's, it's very strange. Um, and then we also saw scarps. This is a, a slight ridge at the end of the at the edge of the streak. Here's a place where the streak travels through a crater, where the edge goes through a crater, and it just keeps going. It's not even diverted by this crater. And we're also pointing to this different texture, both inside and outside of the streak. So these are some of the first times that we've seen inside and outside of a streak. And it took having this super high resolution data from the high rise camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to get the information we needed. So what this did it is it let us estimate the total volume of material that was, that was moved during an event like this. And then we can extrapolate up to global mass transport. And what that tells you is that if our assumptions are correct, this is, this is a lot of sediment that's transported in the formation of these slope streaks. It's actually comparable or on the same order of magnitude to what's transported in global dust, global, global dust events. So from global dust storms. So a lot of material could be moved in these. Even though each single individual streak is very small, there's a lot of them. And there's new ones forming all the time. So this is the sort of thing that we can do with active geologic processes that are going on on Mars. And right now, I'm actually using the fading of these streaks to attempt to quantify how material is, is, is moved around on the surface again, through global dust transport, but not in the formation of these features, but as they fade. When they form, they're dark. And then over time, dust gets deposited on them, and they get brighter. And so by quantifying that fading, we can understand how dust is transported in between streak formation events. So let me move away from Mars. Mars is cool, but the outer solar system is even cooler, temperature-wise, and also just in the diversity of worlds. So Here's some of my favorite places, the Galilean satellites. These are the, the four large satellites of Jupiter. And what we've got here are um, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. It's that, we call it the pizza planet sometimes. It's, it's, really, it's really that. I mean, the colors are stretched a bit, but it's really those colors. It's really red and yellow and white and black. The black ones, I think, look like little anchovies, maybe olives on the surface. But those are actually, those are actually lava flows. Um, 
And then we have Europa, which is the second one. And Europa is this really bright, and in Europa, the colors are stretched. So if you were looking at Europa, you would just see a bright kind of white feature, white, almost featureless surface uh, with a few large linear features. And then Ganymede and Callisto are the two larger ones. So what's going on in the Jupiter system that causes geologic activity? Again, we're, we're far away from the sun. We're five times further than we are here on Earth. So the amount of energy from the sun is really limited. But what happens is you have a resonance. So every time uh, Ganymede goes around Jupiter once, Europa goes around twice, and Io goes around four times. So it's this elegant dance of celestial mechanics. So normally, over time, the orbit of a, of a satellite would tend to circularize. So that means that if you only had one big moon around Jupiter, its orbit would be nice and circular. The same side would always be facing Jupiter, and it's the distance from that moon to Jupiter wouldn't change. But because we have these three moons in a resonance, that means that you have something called a forced eccentricity. So the distance, basically, as these moons go around in this one to two to four resonance, they tend to line up at the same time in their orbit every time. So this squishes the orbits. This gives you an eccentric orbit. And so this is greatly exaggerated, of course. But in the case of Europa, sometimes Europa is closer to Jupiter, and sometimes it's further away. So that means that Jupiter's gravitational tug on the surface varies depending on where it is in its orbit. So the surface gets squished, it gets stretched and pulled as it goes up and down due to the strong gravity. And it's this flexing, it's this tidal flexing that causes heating. It's just frictional heating. If you picture squeezing a rubber ball, eventually that ball's going to warm up. It'll get you know, a little squishier. That's what's going on on Io, Europa, and Ganymede. And if you remember Callisto, the fourth one, looked pretty boring. It just looked kind of like the moon. It was old. It was cratered. It's not in this resonance. It's too far out. So Callisto has almost no tidal heating. Io is the closest one in, and it has tons of tidal heating. So much that, like I said before, it's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. So I've used some of my change detection techniques to monitor the subtle details of new plume deposits and lava flows that are going on on Io. It's actually the perfect place to test out my change detection techniques because there's so much change going on on the surface that we're, we're sure to find something. So here's the kind of uh, work that I've done. These are images taken by the Galileo spacecraft um, back in 1999. So you can see just a few months apart, uh, this is a big volcano called Prometheus. It looks a little bit like Cape Cod or like, you know, kind of an outstretched arm with a fist. Um, the dark material is lava flows on the surface. The bright sort of circular feature that's surrounding it is a plume deposit. So what's going on is that you have the very you have the tip of this lava flow that's meandering from a hot spot. The very tip, as it encounters the surrounding bright plains, those are deposits of sulfur dioxide frost. So as this warm lava flow tip touches this cold frost, it vaporizes it, and it sends up this plume of material that then deposits in a circular feature surrounding the volcano. So that's what we're seeing here. And so you can see between July and October of 99, there's been some subtle changes going on, both in the tip of the, of the lava flow itself. That shows up as dark in this ratio image. I'll point at this, right? So that shows up as dark, this dark feature up here. And there's also been some changes in the plume deposit itself. You can see that there's this new region here that's darker, and there's also a region that's brightened. So that's changes in the, in the plume, the eruption of material. And here's another place on the surface. So if we're lucky enough to have color data, not just black and white, then we can actually look at the changes in multiple wavelengths. And that's really useful because the lava flows show up as dark, but the um, sulfur dioxide and frost is, very, is, is most visible in a violet filter image. And so you'll see in a second, I'm gonna look, we're going to look at Kanahikili, which is this volcano right here and right here. And so if we zoom in around it, here it is on the first orbit. So here is that, that, that region of the surface in color. Oops, let me go back. And then here it is in three different bands. So the near-infrared, that's about a, a one micron band. And we're displaying that as red. We have a green band and we have a violet band. And in the color image, we're displaying violet as blue. So we've kind of stretched the spectral range a bit down into normal red, red green, blue space so that we can see a bit further than we would just with our own eyes. So if you look at this volcano here, if you just compare the shape of it in the color images, clearly something's gone on. But if we actually take the ratio images, they separate out really nicely what's going on. So we see that, again, there's been some new dark lava flows. That's this dark thing in the middle. And there's a new bright circular plume deposit. 
So that's visible in this near infrared and this green data, but in the violet data, it's a mess, right? And that's because you're really sensitive to this volatile sulfur dioxide frost that's very mobile on the surface. And so then we can stack these three ratio images into a color image and things just kind of get crazy. So I've done this in a bunch of locations on the surface of Io. So here's a volcano Pilon that erupted between these two orbits. So you can see it started off as this kind of innocuous looking feature that barely had a name, it was so boring. And then suddenly you got this new black eye on the surface, this big deposit, this big sort of pyroclastic dark material and some new lava flows in the middle. And then later on we saw it again and it was starting to get filled in by this red material. This is a short chain sulfur, probably S8, that's being ejected from Pele, this volcano that's right down here. So it's ejecting this red material and it's covering over this, this plume deposit. And so you can use these ratios to track the formation of this new feature and also how it's faded over time. And I've also looked at comparing data between the Galileo spacecraft and the New Horizons spacecraft. New Horizons is on its way out to Pluto, but it had a flyby of the Jupiter system, and so it gave us some new data. And so here we can see that more than 7,000 square kilometers of new dark material have been deposited between these two about 10 years later um, in this region down here by Masubi, down near the south pole of Io. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that was a Lerner Regio. This is Masubi here. And so here there's been even more new dark lava flows on the surface. So by just comparing these images, we can say, oh yeah, something happened. But by doing it scientifically, by ratioing them, and by, again, having a, a, a student go and count the number of new dark pixels on the surface, again, this is you know, why we have students, they have very painstakingly gone through and counted the number of pixels, and they can use that to determine exactly how much of the surface has changed, how much has new dark material on the surface. So, Another of my favorite places I have to mention is Europa. And so Europa, if Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system, it's that bright pizza planet, Europa is the next one out. So Europa, Io is so volcanically active that it's long ago driven off all its, all its water. So there's no water on, on Io at all. On Europa, we're pretty sure that there's this surface layer. You can see down here, it's a surface layer that's very bright. It has all these cracks and ridges, and we think under that there's this layer of liquid water. On Europa, we see these cracks, we see ridges, we actually see what look like icebergs, where the surface has cracked and rotated and moved around and frozen back together in a, in a new position on the surface. So it's a, it's a very strange and wonderful place. There's a lot of good evidence for liquid water, and I'll go through this quickly because I want to show some other cool places too, although I'd rather just give an hour-long talk on Europa, but you know, maybe next time. Um, we have evidence from spectroscopy. This is confirmed telescopically, even from the ground, as well as by the Galileo spacecraft. They found the spectral signature of water. Um, and this is what, this, this is sort of the proof. Um, the, the, this is the spectrum of water ice. That's this dotted line here at the top. Okay, I have to show one wiggly line in deference to the spectroscopers, if there's any in the audience. Um, but I think this will be the only one, so don't worry, those of you who like pictures. Um, and so if you compare the, the surface of Europa, you can see that some parts of it really match up nicely with this water ice spectrum, and then some don't match up at all. And I used to call this non-ice contaminants, and actually Frank Drake, if Frank's in the audience, uh, gave me a great comment on one of my proposals saying, don't call them contaminants. That's the interesting stuff. That's the good stuff. So I usually call them non-ice components, okay? So, so the non-ice materials could be salts, like magnesium sulfates. Um, they could be sulfuric acids. They're things that are not ice. And He's right. They're the interesting stuff. We know there's a ton of ice. We have gravitational evidence for this liquid ocean. We know from the deflection of the Galileo spacecraft by Jupiter's gravity that below the ice there's something at the surface about 100 kilometers thick with a density of 1. Unfortunately, the density of solid ice and of liquid water is so close that we can't determine between the two. So either Europa is like this, with a cold, frozen, brittle layer at the surface, and then kind of a warm, convecting ice layer that goes down about 100 kilometers. You know, that's kind of interesting, but not that interesting. Or it's like this, where you have a cold, again, you have a cold, brittle, icy layer at the surface, and then a liquid water layer down beneath. And this, if this model is true, we're talking about more water than in all of Earth's oceans combined. So that's a lot of water. We can't tell yet if it's liquid or solid. The geological evidence sure looks like there's something going on on the surface. 
the magnetic field evidence, it's consistent with the motion of a conducting layer through a, through a strong magnetic field. Um, as it moves out of Jupiter's magnetic field, you get an induced field. Salt water sure matches really nicely. But if there is liquid water close to the surface, maybe there could be geologic activity there. So some of the work that I've done has looked for possible endogenic geological activity on Europa. Maybe there could be plumes. Maybe there could be cryovolcanic material. Maybe we could have new cracks forming. I've gone through and compared in detail the Voyager to Galileo images. And so remember, in those Iowa comparisons, the activity was really obvious. There was really stuff going on there. On Europa, not so much. So here's a, a Galileo image, image A. Here's a Voyager image B. I basically degraded the Galileo to match Voyager as well as possible, co-registered them, took ratios. There's nothing. There's nothing going on. So I've done this everywhere that we have good overlaps between them. I've compared Galileo images to other ones. Here in the ratio image, we're just see this is really stretched. So all we're seeing is the differences in lighting. Remember that the images that I want to find changes are completely opposite the images that everyone else wants. So I keep telling them to, you know, take another picture there. Come on, maybe something changed. We already saw there. We don't want an image there. We don't want to waste our limited resources taking the same picture over and over again. So it's very difficult to find even just little scraps of images at the edges that overlap with each other. So basically, with going through, with co-registering these, with reprojecting them, I found a few places where I was able to do this. I found no, you know, I found no changes at all between Voyager and Galileo. So this is over a 20-year 20, a 20 period. This lets me estimate a maximum resurfacing rate and a minimum surface age for Europa. I've also compared uh, Galileo to images taken again by the, by the uh, New Horizons spacecraft. And no changes, although these are so low resolution that unless we're talking about huge changes on the surface, IO-style volcanism, we probably wouldn't see anything. So I think that the story's still out. Maybe Europa's active, maybe it's not. But I think that the case for there being liquid water pretty close to the surface is really quite strong. We just need to go back there and take more pictures, preferably the same pictures. Right? So there's other places in the solar system that do have geologic activity going on. We have Enceladus. It's this tiny moon of Saturn. It has active venting of material. So, so here's Enceladus. And so the northern hemisphere is kind of old and cratered looking. But you get down toward the south, and you have these weird, smooth features that were called the tiger stripes in the first observations of this. And when we looked at it more closely, there's plumes. They're, they're geyser-like. Plumes, it, it's, it's, they're venting from this region by the South Pole. And if you track back very carefully exactly where each of these plumes come from, they track exactly to the locations of those weird-looking cracks. So clearly, something's going on there. And if you had asked me before this mission, do you think Enceladus would have anything, any geologic activity? I said, no way, because Enceladus is tiny. At least at, at the, the Jupiter system, we have this elegant story with the resonance, with, with Io and Europa and Ganymede, and Io has a lot of activity. On the Saturn system, we're baffled as to how these plumes form. We don't know why they form. We don't know how this little tiny moon that has no right to have anything interesting going on in it has these giant geysers. We have no clue, right? So this is one of the best things about planetary exploration is that you're surprised. We had, okay, we had some clues because we knew that Enceladus was really, really bright. We knew it was embedded in this E-ring. So we knew that it was in this suspicious looking ring around Saturn. So we had some idea that there was something strange going on there, but still, these images are just, are just gorgeous, I think. Then we have Titan. Titan is this huge moon. It has a really thick atmosphere. Um, and the surface pressure is actually 1.6 bars. So that's 1.6 times the pressure of our atmosphere at sea level. It's mostly made out of nitrogen. There's some hydrocarbons. This is really interesting from a chemical point of view because these are building blocks for amino acids. Maybe Titan's atmosphere is this primordial atmosphere that's similar to what Earth looked like before life started polluting it with all this oxygen it was putting out. So it's really cold, though. So when we talk about lakes on Titan, we're not talking about lakes of liquid water. We're talking about lakes of ethane. There could be really interesting photochemistry going on there. And so there was speculation before the Cassini mission made it out to the Saturn system that maybe the whole surface is covered with liquid. And we didn't find that, but we did find that there were lakes. And this was detected with the, the, the radar instrument. The problem is that the atmosphere in Titan is so thick, it's really hard to see through at any decent visible wavelengths. 
but with radar tuned to the right wavelength, you can see through and make, make maps of the surface, kind of like what we did on Venus. So with radar, you're looking at a combination of roughness and dielectric constant. That gives you the, the brightness in your images. So what that tells you is that maybe there, there's compositional differences, but you're mostly seeing texture. So these features up here, these are really smooth. You have these really smooth regions. There's nothing that's that smooth except liquid. There's, there's no way unless you had, you know, someone took a sheet of glass and spread it across the surface just to fool our radar instrument. No, it's, it's, it's liquid. It's probably liquid ethane or methane. And interestingly, we've seen changes in some of these lakes, seasonal changes. So Cassini has been in the Saturn system for long enough. It's been taking observations of these lakes. Between 2005 and 2009, we found that a lake had shrunk, the boundary of the lake had shrunk um, with a change in volume of about 15 cubic kilometer. So that's consistent with the evaporation of either the methane or ethane liquid from this lake due to seasonal changes. So there's something going on in Titan. Titan's kind of an interesting case because it has this thick atmosphere. It might have these interesting processes going on on the surface, but I think the story is still out as to whether this is really endogenic or whether it's more like a Mars-like condition where you have stuff blowing around or moving around on the surface that has very little to do with what's going on in the subsurface. So I think we don't know for sure if Titan really goes into this category of places with endogenic activity or not. But it certainly is a really fascinating place. And here's what the surface looks like. Remember, we landed on Titan. Here's what the, the Huygens probe looked like, the, the, the image that it took from the surface compared with an image of the moon scaled to sort of the same perspective. The Huygens probe was not a big Mini Cooper-sized vehicle that landed on the surface. It was a little, a little tiny. I mean, it was you know, decent size, but you know, not human size. And so the perspective is from very low. So when you see these images, these often look like boulders, and they're not. They're actually just little kind of pebbles. Um, what I think is really cool is that Titan's surface looked a lot more familiar than I would have predicted. If you compare the surfaces of Mars, this one here and this one, the second and fourth are Mars, the Spirit and the Viking 2 landing site. If you compare it to Titan right here in the middle, it looks familiar. And then if you compare these three to Venus, Remember, we've landed on Venus. Well, not we. The Soviet Union landed successfully multiple times on Venus. The US still has yet to do that. The Venera missions took a series of images, and these have been reprocessed recently. Um, someone dug up the old, you know, I don't even know what kind of tapes these things were on. They dug up the old data, got it converted over to modern media, and used modern image processing techniques. And so the new Venera landing images are just gorgeous. If any of you have old textbooks, the Venera images are all these weird, distorted-looking, grainy-looking images. And now, with the miracle of modern computers, we can make them look pretty amazing. And again, these are the only pictures we have of the surface of Venus, so it's worth the effort. So this is sort of what it looks like on the surface of Venus. And you can see that there's some differences, but this is over orders of magnitude from so hot that lead would melt on the surface of Venus to so cold that liquid ethane and methane flow on the surface of Titan, they look familiar. There's a lot of similarities. And I really find this sort of a triumph of, of comparative geology, of, of planetary science, that we can use the same suite of surface processes to explain what's going on over this huge range of temperature and pressure and composition. It looks the same. It looks familiar. It looks like you could be there. So there, there's other places that are, that are weird and interesting. There's Triton, a moon of Neptune. Maybe someday we'll go back and see Triton. We flew by it once with Voyager, haven't been there since. But we found these plumes of nitrogen. And again, could this, is this just a little exogenic or, or sort of an atmosphere surface interaction where you have nitrogen that's deposited and then vents back out into sort of an exosphere? Or could this be a sign that there's something going on in the subsurface? We don't know. So change detection techniques in general they can reveal details of ongoing geologic activity on worlds such as Mars and Io. They can help us search for activity on Europa and Enceladus. And they could be used in the future on Triton, on Titan. And they could help us understand surface age, resurfacing rates, global dust transport. They really let us highlight the most interesting regions of a planet's surface. If there's liquid water close to the surface, that's interesting for astrobiology. If we see liquid, if we see motion, if we see something going on at the surface, that tells us something about the subsurface structure. And it lets us understand how these, how these worlds work. 
in a global sense. It lets us understand resurfacing rates, surface age, heat flow, especially somewhere like Iowa where it's so volcanic. And regions of current ongoing activity are great places to target future high resolution observations, maybe even future landers. So my caveat from the image processing change detection point of view is that we really need to optimize image pairs if we're going to be looking for changes. Ideally, we'd plan observations to match these pre-existing views of features of interest. And I accept that, okay, they're probably not going to listen to me when they're planning the entire observation suite for a new mission. They're not going to want to look at the same old places over and over again. They're going to look at something new and different and exciting, but okay. So if they're not going to do that, then at least plan missions with compatible filters to previous ones and let them study, at least go over the same coverage areas and give me some little shreds on the edges to look for changes in. One of the ongoing frustrations is that every mission seems to come with a new set of filters. The, the camera designers seem to, seem to sort of start from scratch and come up with, oh, let's have a filter at 0.889 microns this time or 0.756. And then you're trying to compare it with previous ones where they're at you know, 0.68 and there's, they're, the band passes are totally different. The part of the spectrum that the filters are sensitive to are totally different. Makes it really difficult to compare things. So future missions, is this the end? We've, we're coming up on the tail end of what you could call the golden age of planetary exploration. We've done the first reconnaissance, reconnaissance of all the planets, and pretty soon we'll even have gone by Pluto, which was a planet when New Horizons launched, and is no longer a planet, but you know we're still going there. It's OK. Um, robotic spacecraft have revealed these dramatic new vistas. They've helped us study past climate change on the Earth. They've led to new robotic technologies. They also inspire the next generation of explorers, especially landers. And so as a planetary scientist, there's the robotic exploration side of things at NASA, and then there's the human exploration side of things. And there's often this uneasy balance between the two, where the robot people want to send fleets of robots, and the human exploration people just want to send people, and they don't really care what the people are doing. They just want to launch them, right? And we're here saying, well, but if you go here and send an army of robots, you can do so much more. And what we have to remember is that, remember that, that self-portrait, that curiosity took, that the you know, I am here shot that it sent home to mom back at JPL. That's what grabs you because that's what lets you put yourself in the shoes of one of these robots. It lets you imagine yourself on the surface of one of these planets, one of these satellites. So the two have to go together. There have to be robotic exploration that's doing the science, but you have to keep in mind the fact that you're also revealing places that are just points of light in the sky. You're turning them into worlds that maybe one day you know, our children or our children's children can dream of going. We need both. Part of the problem is that to get anything hard is expensive, right? And to get to the outer solar system is hard. To build a mission like Curiosity is hard. It requires an investment of time, direction, and dollars. Curiosity is the last flagship level mission in the pipeline. Flagship level means, you know, a couple billion dollars, okay? And yeah, okay, that's expensive. But there's a lot of things that we could be doing with money in this country. Sending a rover to Mars is something that we can all agree on. The Curiosity landing was broadcast in Times Square, New York City, the middle of the night. You know, two in the morning, you had people sitting on the sidewalks and applauding and yelling, NASA, you know, picture what, what else has the capability to bring us together at a time of great political strife, great problems internationally. Our planetary exploration program is something that we can be proud of. It's a great thing to spend a couple billion dollars on. So we need more missions. And that's where I'll end. Thank you. Cynthia, if I could kick off the questions. Um, so we've got Brittany Schmidt is uh, going to be here in three weeks to okay. talk about uh, Europa. And she's interpreted Europa's um, undulating surfaces as due to tectonics in that, uh, on that moon, right? What, what's the best resolution uh, images that you were able to use on Europa? We have a handful. And when I say a handful, I literally mean if you put the image numbers in your hand, you have you know four, right? We have a very few images that are at a resolution of maybe five meters per pixel on Europa, little postage stamps. That's it, because the Galileo spacecraft 
was supposed to have this big high gain antenna and have this great downlink rate back to Earth, and then the Challenger spacecraft, the Challenger space shuttle exploded. This is when everything had to be launched from the space shuttle. So this thing was built with a folding antenna, kind of like an umbrella to fit inside the space shuttle cargo bay. It was going to be brought to space for free by the shuttle because that's free, right? It doesn't cost anything. You get into Earth orbit and then you kind of, you know, gently use a robotic arm to put it out into space and then it turns on its rockets and goes. So this thing was built to fit into the, the cargo bay. And unfortunately, well, fortunately it wasn't on Challenger. It was supposed to be a couple missions after Challenger. So it was all built and sitting in a warehouse at, in Florida. And it had to sit for a couple year, extra years, um, basically, between the loss of the Challenger shuttle and then the return to flight, and it had to get back in the mission queue. So by the time this thing was launched, it had been sitting there for a lot longer than anyone expected. So the high gain antenna had been sitting folded when they launched it and tried to open the antenna. It got stuck. So our data rate was seriously reduced. And that was one of the big tragedies of the Galileo mission, is that instead of having it was supposed to have you know, high definition movies that was going to send back and amazing panoramas. And instead, we were just limited to this trickle of data, these few postage stamps. And fortunately, again, these, these I can't say enough about the amazing engineers down at JPL who managed to, the, the computer on the Galileo spacecraft had about as much RAM as one of your little solar powered pocket calculators. If any of you don't use one of the, you've heard of those, right? A calculator. It's not on your phone, it's actually a standalone kind of thing. Um, it had something like, you know, the, 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 the RAM in this computer was measured in, in bytes. It had, you know, not, not mega, you know, like, you know, 32 bytes or something of RAM. So the engineers managed to come up with these amazing compression sequences so that you could take images and compress them and store them on this tape recorder, right? It's, it was a tape recorder on the spacecraft. Seriously, a tape recorder. And then the tape recorder started dying, and so then they'd have to play, so they'd have to take images during close approach and then play them back really slowly during the part where they were far away from Jupiter or far away from whatever they had to close by. But anyway, the data weight was really limited. So I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry, I lost the, the thread of your question. <laughs> Thank you, Rance. <laughs> you can get me going on about Galileo anytime. Hey, you brilliant talk. Um, I'm curious about uh, the uh, streaks on Mars. Uh, what is the, um, so you said that they were contrast stretched. I'm curious, what would it look like to us looking at it? Could we see the streaks with our eye if we were standing there? And, and what is the slope of the, I mean, is, these are really steep slopes or these are really gentle slopes. What, is, uh, what are the slopes of these dark streaks that we see? The contrast ratio is about 10%. So I've had, I've had this debate with people, actually. If you're standing next to one of these things, would you see it? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you wouldn't even notice. It would just look like kind of a subtle albedo variation on the surface. Um, the slopes they go down are, I don't, have the, I don't know the number offhand, but they're, they're not super steep. They're fairly gentle. Yeah. Hi, Cinzia. Uh, what's your favorite hypothesis for the um, slope streak formation of Mars, wet or dry? If you want to ask which one I think is the most exciting, then I think a wet formation hypothesis would certainly win. It would be really cool if these were evidence of a subsurface liquid water reservoir of some sort that's there today. Probably they're dry. And that's just because there's, there, there's a lot of evidence that leans in the dry direction. We, there's a lot of dust. There, we know that there's these dust avalanches. There's pretty good models for them. It could be that, there, that, there, that there's multiple explanations. And we see this whole suite of features. So maybe some of them are wet. Maybe some of them are dry. Maybe some of them are mostly dry with a little bit of lubrication by some sort of liquid. I think the jury's still out. Will MSL Curiosity uh, give us evidence to distinguish between the dry and the wet model, or, or any other planned, uh, planned new data? Um, I don't think that Curiosity is going to go, I don't, I don't know of any streaks that are in Gale Crater, which is the landing site for Curiosity, so my guess would be no. If, as it goes up these layers, if it discovers signs of some sort of liquid, then that would be really exciting for not just the slope streaks, but for everything we know about Mars geology. But I don't know of any observations that it's going to make in particular that would tell us more about that. I remember uh, there were some um, pictures of a landslide, actually, 
uh, inside one of the craters of Mars that you didn't show, but uh, I was wondering if you, uh, if uh, um, MRO has gone back to look at that region again and see if a streak had formed you know, in the uh, wake of the landslide. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the difference between a slope streak and a landslide, a landslide would be much, much bigger, right? So we're talking about big material, boulders, rocks that are falling down on one of these streaks. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and I remember that one. It was really cool. And I don't know if, if anyone's gone back to see if there was a streak there. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I assume there's no spectroscopic evidence of uh, water in the streaks? They're small and they're hard to resolve, but no. We've, we've tried. Sorry. Did anybody think about a, a, a seismic sensor net uh, as used in oil exploration and others? Um, that's the next mission. The next mission to Mars is going to have seismometers. And so that's the, the next discovery mission that's been chosen. So they were choosing between a mission that would put some seismometers on Mars, a mission that would go and jump around to different locations on a nucleus of a comet, and one that would put a boat on Titan. And Mars won. Say what you will about Mars exploration. They certainly are uh, successful. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, that there's volcanic activity uh, several uh, on several bodies uh, in the solar system. So there's enough interior heat for there to be volcanic activity, uh, but, uh, but not enough actually for tectonics. Uh, and, uh, and so I wondered, how, how could you determine uh, whether there's tectonics there or not? It a, would be a very slow process, one would think. Uh, and uh, and is Earth the only body that has tectonics, plate tectonics? Yeah, so, the, so there's two different questions. In terms of volcanic activity, it depends on, you, on how you define a volcano. Okay, so there's Io that has these, they're definitely volcanoes. They're melted, you know, rock or material that's being, that's flowing on the surface in these lava flows, being, it's being vented off. I don't think anyone would dispute that Io has volcanic activity. Anywhere else, there's this, this idea called cryovolcanism, which is sort of cold volcanism, and it's controversial. I have yet to see anything. People point to these things that look like they're flow-like features. They're on cold, icy worlds. And people say, oh, it's cryovolcanism. But you, there's always another alternate explanation. And so I have yet to see really convincing evidence of cryovolcanism. In terms of tectonics, um, Europa and a lot of the outer solar system satellites have tectonic activity, or at least they had in the past, and that makes these cracks and ridges and breaks on the surface that we see. Plate tectonics is another story, and that's where you have this sort of combined coherent motion of plates on the surface, and you have subduction zones, and you have new spreading zones. And yes, as far as we know, Earth is the only place that we've found a system of plate tectonics. And interestingly, on Mars, we have the biggest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. And if we compare the, the model for the formation of something like that, you probably have something similar to, say, the Hawaiian Islands on Earth, where you have a hot spot under the crust that's building material up. But on the Earth, the crust moves over that hot spot, and so you get chains of islands. So on Mars, if there's no plate tectonics, the crust isn't moving. So it just keeps building up in one place and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's one possible reason why Olympus Mons is so big, is that there isn't plate tectonics on Mars. Uh, with your <clears throat> Europa, there's that beautiful picture <clears throat> which shows that uh, at some time the surface is broken up into little blocks that look just like icebergs. Uh, and you can tell from the iceberg <clears throat> geometry that the, uh, the ice layer must have been only about 10 kilometers thick and it was floating in maybe slush or maybe water. So doesn't that say that it's, there's a lot of liquid water on Europa? It sure looks like icebergs floating in some kind of liquidy, mushy stuff. But unfortunately for the liquid water camp, you can do it with kind of slushy, squishy ice. You don't actually need liquid. Um, and so if you have, say, a, a diapir, so a thermal plume that's rising up through the ice, it gets relatively close to the surface, maybe close enough to break up and mobilize some of these, these features of the surface, but you don't necessarily need liquid 
actually making it all the way to the surface. So there, there are ways to do it without it, although it sure seems like good evidence. Although the, the, those icebergs are a lot bigger than they look. I have a print in my office where someone took that image and they put in the Titanic to scale, and big iceberg, big, big, big Titanic. So they're, they're really big. I'm just going to do one last question, and I do want to emphasize this topic will be beaten to death in three weeks by Brittany Schmidt, who wrote the science paper to describe why this was liquid water on Europa that caused these features. She's coming in three weeks. In the evening, the last question is Cliff, and uh, then we'll uh, wrap up. Hi, it's a Mars question, so it's not about Europa. Um, I read an article to, on the plate tectonics uh, thing, and in the last couple of weeks, I read an article that suggested there might be two plates on Mars, contrary to, to common thinking. And uh, I was wondering if that, the new mission you describe about the seismology might be able to determine whether Mars has one or two plates, or whether that article has any credence in the Mars geology community. My understanding is that that's a pretty controversial paper. Um, and so I wasn't involved with it, and I don't, I'm not up on all the details, but it's it's an interesting suggestion. But I would say that it's not it it's not necessarily borne out by the evidence that we see. But it's an interesting idea. Maybe it'll go. You know, maybe maybe it'll go somewhere. Maybe that will prove to be right. So Cynthia, um, we have a special mug here. You can fill it with water or uh, ice at your uh, <laughs> at your decision. Okay, <laughs> water. So Please ice, join me in thanking Cynthia. Thank you.